Okay, I'm going to get started. So my name is Marian Morchetti. I'm an attorney in Reese Legal Department. My presentation is about the relationship between the business points of a deal and the legal work that underlies it. So I'm going to start you all off with a Shark Tank episode. Most of you know Shark Tank, where business owners come with product concepts and they pitch to the sharks um, so they can get investment in their deals. This product is called DinoSafe. It is like many of the other Shark Tank products, which is cute at first with limited real utility. So the discussion here isn't anything novel, but it highlights the features of a business deal that will lead into my presentation. Hi Sharks, I'm Rebecca. And I'm her husband, Eric. We're from Arizona seeking $150,000 for 15% equity in DinoSafe. Dino Introducing DinoSafe, Dino the patented smart home temperature controlled safe that secures to the porch and is essential for contactless deliveries. Our conversations with Grocery has revealed that they desperately want to roll this out as part of a subscription model. Have We're you not licensed any of it? Consumer. I haven't licensed, in, licensed any yet. I'm in conversations with someone, uh, a great big box retail in the United States. Let me tell you the thing that's the, the most special about this. My patenting protects having the ability to do one click unlock and adjust the temperature inside. The thermostat. So you want to have a subscription for it, and I'm guessing it sends a unique code. The software sends a unique code right. to whoever's doing the delivery. That's right. That's everybody's saying we can't do it. Only Rebecca can do it. I, I own the yes. patent, and they cannot add the temperature control and smart together. The combination is really smart, right? Because the temperature control really is the key, right? Because there's a dozen different ways to do a smart unlock. Okay, so you get the idea. They have this box. It sits on the front porch. It locks. Um, it's climate controlled. The delivery guy gets a code. The delivery person can put something in it that's refrigerated, even your blueberries, and um, nobody can steal your stuff. Um, like I said, sounds cute at first. It's all about marketing and um, limited real utility, like a lot of the things on, on Shark Tank. Um, so you'll notice some key elements in the discussion. Um, they, you heard the word patent. Is it is the patent going to be effective? Is it going to check out? Uh, marketing to grocery. Is the product actually going to sell? They've licensed the product to stores. Technology. Is it innovative? Is the product useful? Is it novel? These are the things that the sharks care about. What's the real value? So now we'll get to the offers. Because it'll just be an app that you walk up, it says, oh, I recognize my app via Bluetooth, RF, whatever it may be. Right. And it sends a code to that app that allows it to be unlocked. And so because you have so far to go in terms of catching up with state of the art, in terms of walk up unlocking, that's a real challenge. And it's going to be very difficult for you to keep up. And so for those reasons, I'm out. We're all in. We're definitely all in, Lori. No, there, there's yeah. no joke. I think what you did is so smart. I love that you have a patent, but what I don't love is, is that I'm still a little confused about all of this. I just can't think of what are going to be all the steps that I'm going to do to help you. So unfortunately, for these reasons, I'm out. Robert, what are you going to do? My new world ways of doing this, securing stuff, makes me very interested if the patent holds. But I don't want to own 15% of it. I want to own 51% of it. Oi. All right, so here, Robert's offering to give $150,000, and he wants 51% of the company because he wants to control it. Kevin says he'll give $150,000 for 40% of the company. Um, by the way, the monetary stake in this is the economic right. That doesn't necessarily equate to control um, of the decision making. Um, so this last clip is going to be Robert's best offer. Let me take a different stab at it, OK? I also don't know if your patent has merit. I just don't. But I'm going to do the 150, um, but I don't want control. I'd like to get 40 percent because either this is oh. binary, it's either going to work or it isn't. We're going to go and license the technology. That's my offer. 
You have two offers, you have to pick one. Here's what I'll do. You came in looking for 150,000 for 15%. I will give you the 150,000 for 25%. But we create a board of directors. Certainly. I get more seats than the two of you. That's original. If the three of us get in a yeah. room and there's two paths in front of us. Right. I need the ability to say. Robert, do you want me to be one of those board for seats? Yeah, I'd love to have Mark. He that wants to be stuff. a controlling member. I, I, so I, that's I why he that. wants more board seats. Lori, thank you. Okay, so in this last clip, Robert was going to give the same amount. And he wasn't as concerned with the economic stake, but he definitely wanted control. So he wanted to make sure that in the documents of the entity that he was going to be able to make the decisions. Conveniently enough, he was also going to get Cuban on the board. So clearly it sounded like a good deal. So in a Shark Tank episode, you're going to hear the fundamental business concepts, but you also heard hints of the legal issues and some of the diligence issues that they'll be investigating and that we investigate when we look into deals here at Reef. So uh, this presentation is about what underlies the business points. So those are the deal points. The principals here at Reef and our acquisition teams, they make the deals. They go out, they decide how much economic in interest in this deal do I want? How much am I willing to pay? How much control do I want? Or how much do I deserve based on what I'm willing to pay? Um, these were clearly the essential aspects of what goes on in Shark Tank. Those are the, the stuff that people cling on to. It's tangible, it's easy to understand. So diligence is also done in part by our acquisitions teams, the business folks. You heard Richard say, let's see if the patent checks out. He knows he needs further investigation. He's going to turn that inquiry over to the legal team. Here at Reef, we do real estate acquisitions. So I'll explain more about diligence as it relates to property acquisitions and project investments. So what is the difference? Um, in a project investment, it can be a joint venture, a partner or a few partners. Um, or an investment opportunity, which potentially has a lot of different investors and a given individual who's a common class investor has limited to no control over the decision making in the company. In both of these, you're working with others through an entity that controls the relationship between the partners or the investors. In either type of project investment, the entity docs are very important. So in addition to the standard diligence, where you think about what you're actually buying, what you're investing in, you also need to think through voting, management, and other factors related to working with others. So the documents, the last of these three Ds, is how it all comes together. That's in legal court. We draft the paperwork to make sure our clients know what they're getting and that we don't leave any room for game playing. So I'll go over these topics in more detail. So moving to the real estate realm, this is what we do here at Reef. Um, we will buy properties, which may be undeveloped land to build on, or we might buy commercial businesses, which could be apartments and hotels. We also join with other groups to do the same things. That means we're entering into an entity structure. So for property acquisitions, basic versus complex. Um, some of you may have seen the standard real estate home purchase contract. So that's going to be on the basic side. Um, what are the processes for standard diligence? Let's get a home inspector out there. Let's make the seller tell us any secrets about the house. Was there any flooding? Were there any asbestos or lead paint issues? That's all going to be in a standard home purchase contract. And these, the ones that they c come out with, with the Realtors Association, they cover all the basics and they're solid contracts. And when we get into commercial or complex deals, you'll find the same concepts, but they might be more detailed or lengthy or very custom to the nature of the deal because the investors are a little more savvy and they want something a lot more specific. Um, so for example, if we go under contract to buy a piece of land to develop a subdivision of rental homes, you're going to want to know, can we get the zoning approval we need? What about the utilities to service the property? Do we have to dig a sewer? Can we get the governmental approval to do all of it? These are the questions we answer before we even buy the property. So here's an example of, you know, the start of the standard home purchase contracts. Here are a couple of the other sections. Um, there's a title review section. So there's a company called a title company. Many of you may know about the title review process, but they run a search of the county records to make sure, for example, is the seller the owner of the property? Does the seller have the right to actually give you this piece of property? Are there any liens filed on the property? 
Suppose the owner had a new roof put on last year and financed it with a loan and he put up the home for collateral. You're going to want to make sure that that is paid off before you actually purchase the property. That's the point of having a title search. Um, and then there's a property condition section and that talks about the right to inspect the property. And there's a certain time period by which to do that. And when we get into per commercial properties, we might include the same sections, but more lengthy access rights. And sometimes we require the current owner to help us get the approvals that we need. Um, they may have more information about the local, the local government or you know, some connections that we need to get the approvals that we need. So here, imagine if you're buying a hotel, you're buying an operating property and it's a lot more complex. So in your purchase agreement, you're also going to want to know how much revenue is the hotel making? What kind of insurance cover coverage do you have? Is there any ongoing litigation? Do you have a website for marketing? What about a franchise license agreement? Who manages the property and hires the employees? Are the employees coming with? When we buy the place, are the employees going to come with? So now we'll move on into project investment, which is buying an investment in an entity that is owning some sort of investment, either a property in our case, or it could be any type of investment. Like in the DinoSafe example, it was investment in a, in a product, a consumer product. So your investment will run through the entity. So the preliminary question is, how do you all put up your money? Is somebody going to go buy the chairs and the tables? Another person buys the food? Another person buys, you know, whatever the kitchen equipment is? No, you're clearly going to be putting all your money into the entity, and then the entity makes decisions about how to spend the money. So if you're wiring your money into an entity, an entity's bank account, you better know how that entity functions, figure out how you're going to get your money back. So when you get to the entity, um, this is an example of a limited liability company. And I know David talked to you all about the different types of entities last week. Um, but the operating agreement, if you're working with a limited liability company, the operating agreement is where you're going to find all that important stuff about how, how, what distributions come in, who has control, who manages the place, and um, what your economic rights are based on whatever percentage interest you have in the company. So let me make a distinction, and I hinted at this earlier on, between a joint venture and a holding company. So in this picture, you have two happy people entering into, let's presume they're 50-50 partners. They might be 70-30, where somebody puts up 70% of the cash, the other, the other person 30%, and then they make decisions about their economic interest based on maybe the 30% person is doing a lot more work for the actual management and the operations. And, but relatively, they share in the decisions and distributions relatively in line with their economic contributions. Then there's the holding company. So when Reef goes out with an offering to get 100, 200 investors, each of them putting up $50,000, $100,000, and the deal requires a total of $7 million, are those common class investors going to get much control? No, clearly they're not. They're going to be, they're offering take it or leave it. This is how many units your investment will be worth. This is how you get distribution from it. So whether you have any voting control or none, you still want to know what you're getting. So when you invest in a holding company, you need to read the offering documents. Those are the legal disclosure documents that go with an offering. When the reef raises money into a holding company, we'll call it an issuer. We put out a set of documents to tell investors what you're getting. We advise them of the risks involved so they can make a wise decision about whether the investment is right for them. And now I will go through some of the offering documents. The equity package. This is the nice reader-friendly publication with charts and pictures. I'll send this around so you guys can check it out. Um, as I mentioned, if you're entering into a hotel project, you're going to want to know about the hotel. You want to want to know. You want a description of it. You want to know what the operating revenue is. When they when, how much profit? Yeah, the operating revenue and profit. What you're actually buying. Um, you're also going to want project information. So. You want to know about the management decisions and the distribution plans. So the holding period, how long is the entity going to hold the investment? That's a management decision. If you don't have control over the management decisions, you certainly want to know how those decisions are being made. Um, are we making improvements on the property? What's the budget? How are we going to spend our money? Are we going to spend it wisely? When do I start to get paid and how much do I get? Clearly, that's going to be at the top of an investor's mind. Most of that stuff will go into the pit stack. 
Then we get to the legal document. That pitch deck does not go out until we publish a private placement memorandum. It's required by securities laws, so you can't just pitch the ideal image. You have to give investors full information. So legal takes everything in the package, and we the project plans, the investor returns, and we qualify it. We say, hey, this is what we expect if everything goes well. Here are the things that could mess it up, mess up the project plans. In fact, we can't guarantee you'll get anything back. So also in the PPN, you'll get information about management. So in general, sponsor, the party that's putting things together, Reef in this case, should have the relevant experience to manage the project. You're not going to want to invest in a project put together by people who have never bought a project like that before. So in the equity request, you'll see Rich Reef pitches its investment experience and shows all the nice projects that we've done. And in the PPM, we tell investors, hey, we've done all this stuff. Past performance does not indicate that this project is going to fall in line exactly with what happened in the past. <clears throat> so we also attach the operating agreement to the PPM. It's the, the very important returns information are discussed in the PPM, and they are provided in legal language in the operating agreement. So a lot of the same stuff that you'll see in the PPM is written sort of in legalese, or not legalese, but the actual technical legal document is the, is the operating agreement. So we try to describe it in sort of a narrative form in the PPM so that investors can see it a few different times. Okay, so this is the waterfall. So from an, invector, an investor's perspective, probably the most important provision is this waterfall. That's the distribution provision. It shows investors how the profit will be distributed. When revenue comes in, the company pays the expenses first. So if you have a loan, the loan is getting paid monthly. That's going to be at the top before you even get into the waterfall. Then who gets paid next? How much and then what? So um, in this example, you'll see the preferred return comes before the common class. So if you have a preferred member that's providing 30%, maybe 50%, maybe even a substantially greater amount of the equity, they're going to want to know that they get paid first. Um, and then comes the common class. Maybe they'll catch up to whatever the return was provided to the, um, to the preferred member. And that at the end, if there's a remainder profit, the sponsor gets to determine where that profit goes. So often we will at reef the sponsor gets work i mean the sponsor gets a cut because they've put in so much work on the project that obviously they're doing it for something so you gotta love a presentation that ends abruptly um so the uh the deal points so in closing the deal point to the fun part the diligence is the quality control and the documents are the implementation you guys have any questions mm -hmm.